Has anyone here ever driven in the city of Honolulu during rush hour? Okay, it's the worst traffic in the United States. So the idea of adding 100 to 150,000 new cars onto this street is not so attractive to them. So they said, what are we going to do? How are we going to meet this challenge? And what they proposed is we're going to build a light rail system. We're going to connect the east side to the west side of the city. And that will allow people to use public transportation. So great, we can take cars off the road. And we, did, we looked at this, we looked at their 21 stations, and we said, well, let's look at who's going to actually ride on these. And we wanted to do some simple walkability analysis. So lucky for us, city of Honolulu had sidewalk networks, a good street network, so we did some walkability. And you'll notice this is the result. Um, the green areas are walkable, the yellow and red areas are bikeable. Um, on the right side, right, we have uh, uh, features that were generated from the street network. They look kind of irregular because they're based on the, on the existing condition. On the left side, you have those weird little circular things. Those are three stations they're planning on building in currently undeveloped land. So we just kind of did a linear distance. So what we did is we, we took that walkability analysis and we extracted out the area that Americans are willing to walk. So these... <laughs> These are the areas where you can actually densify. These are the only places that people will actually walk to these transit stations. So any density you build outside of this, you're actually adding cars. Okay, so now, now we know where we can add density. Um, how much can we add? We figured that, you know, the bottom side here, that's pretty built out. That's near Waikiki, that's downtown, but the rest of it is mostly kind of low-level development. We can accommodate about 80% of the housing demand if we do this densification. But the real question they had is, what is this going to look like? So you showed this map to the public, and they say, uh, okay, so you're going to put 70-story buildings in that green box. That's going to look ugly. I don't like it. I don't support it. And I'm going to vote for a different politician who won't build that. So the real challenge was, what is, what is this going to look like in the future? So the first thing that we had to do, do for them is show them what their existing city looked like. And uh, they started with very little data. They had some textured buildings, some untextured buildings, mostly just had footprints with height information from LIDAR, and then kind of the standard uh, GIS fare. So we worked with them to, to put together a 3D city. So again, here's the route, right? We'll bring in the 21 stations and look at their uh, location along that route. Yeah, there they are. So the, the first piece of data they gave us was their footprints. They had a pretty good extent, most of the city. And then for a little piece of the city, they had some 3D buildings. You can see those down on the bottom right. Now, those 3D buildings were a combination. They were, some of them were textured, some of them weren't. And then, of course, we had all the other GIS information, their walkability analysis, et cetera. And so we wanted to turn that information into a 3D model so they could see their existing conditions. So this is City Engine. City Engine's a 3D platform, it does two things. It can bring in existing 3D information, draw it and represent it. So we took those uh, 3D models they had for textured, untextured buildings, imported them in and showed them what they had, the extent that they had. So here's those, here's those textured buildings, they were pretty good quality and uh, we're quite pleased with that. But they had these uh, sections where they had nice geometry, like good, good looking exteriors of the buildings, but they had no textures. So we said, well, what can we do? Um, well, we can write a rule to solve this problem. And the challenge was, is where do we get the textures? So I called up the, the GIS manager and I said, man, I wish I knew what these buildings looked like. Uh, can you uh, give me textures of the buildings in certain zoning codes? So go find commercial, high density, mixed use, and take a picture of a site of one of those buildings for me. So he uh, talked to his employees. They actually drove around the city for three days taking pictures for us. And we wrote a rule that applied textures to the sides of buildings based on what zoning code they fell in. So that allowed us to very, very quickly apply textures to a large amount of untextured buildings to make them look realistic. And then the rest of the data was footprints. And so footprints, we grabbed elevation information from LIDAR, right, so we could get the height of them, and used the same rule to extrude a form, and then used the zoning codes again for the city to put textures on all these buildings. We textured... It was over 100,000 buildings. In this case, right now, we're just rendering 10,000 in this scene. But you can see it's, it's, it's decently quick. 
And then we uh, collected from the CAD information um, a 3D model of the actual rail station. We could drop that in context and show them what, the, what this would look like if they actually built this light rail system that went through their downtown, right? So they had little rail cars and stuff on it. So that got us to the first part very, very quickly. So the, the total time to get them from mostly 2D data, a little bit of 3D data, to having a 3D city was only about two or three days. That wasn't too painful. But the next challenge we had is, is how do we model the change? So we want to add density. Can we, how do we incorporate walkability into the city engine? Where is this density going to go? What's it going to look like? And one of the big challenges is uh, uh, how we get this information and how we do rapid iteration. So um, like many cities, they are required uh, to use multiple contractors on different designs. So you're working with a group of five or six contractors, sometimes as many as 12. Um, believe it or not, they don't all use the same software. They don't all follow the same data model. They don't author data in the same way. So we were getting piles of data in lots of different formats. So the question was, is how can we integrate those together into one, into one system? So we brought, the, uh, we brought the walkability analysis in a city engine. And then the first contractor we worked with, what they provided us was simple massing models. So they'd done these simple gray blocks, handed them to us and said, here's your densification. We showed that to the city and said, well, that's not very attractive. What can we do about that? Well, we'd, we'd spent all this time authoring this rule with kind of uh, archetypal zoning textures, right, based on the zoning code. And so we went back to them and said, hey, can you, can you give us your zoning plan? And they sure said, no problem here. And they sent, sent us a CAD file <laughs> with, their, uh, with their drawings. We brought that in, imported it. And we use the zoning codes from, th from that CAD file to actually render textures on top of these in City Engine to give it a more realistic look. And you can notice they did a good job. They stayed within the walkable area. That's the kind of density they're proposing around that station. OK, easy enough. All the other ones are going to be just that easy. Um, so we went to the next contractor and said, hey, give us your massing models. And they said, oh, we don't have massing models. All we have is zoning change. So this zoning changes shows us, you know, what, how we're going to uh, add density to the area. You know, we have height requirements, et cetera, in there. Obviously, you can use that to generate your buildings. And yeah, we could. We worked to generate a new rule. First thing that rule did is generate these volumes. These volumes represent the maximum area you can build based on the zoning regulation they put inside, those, inside that zoning code. So you notice it's got setbacks, stepbacks, uh, angles, uh, uh, setback angles at the tops, and then, then, of course, a maximum height. So we authored a rule that would fill that with uh, actual buildings, representative buildings of what might be built there if they followed this design. Now, the challenge we had when we did this was, um, you know, you, con you contact the contractor and you say, okay, give me your design, and then two days later you get an email and they say, oh, we changed it. Um, you know, if, you'd been if we'd been using building or manually building 3D models, that would have been incre incredibly pro problematic. But we're using this automated method to generate these features. So they could just pass us a new design, and we could actually reapply this rule. So here what I'm going to quickly do is uh, these are rendered on color based on land use. We can also render them based on textures. So we have those archetypal textures for the different zoning codes that they were using. Add those textures in. But we could also take a new plan, substitute the new plan in, and then very quickly render what that new plan would look like. So it, it created this kind of call and response. We weren't, we weren't, there wasn't a deadline limit for the, for the point when they had to finish making changes to their plan. They could continuously make changes to their plan. They could send us a new plan every day, every two days, twice a day. And we could just re-render it as we needed to show them what the, what the impacts were. We could do floor area calculations off those to show them what the total floor area was. We could give them total impervious surface calculations. So it created this kind of really flexible, really flexible system. So the city was happy with that. We, we were able to consume data from a variety of contractors. We would be able to start representing density. Um, then the election came around, and one of the candidates was running on a platform that light rail is bad, and we shouldn't do light rail. So now the question becomes, what happens if we don't, don't build light rail? 
so the challenge is, was, is where will this growth go? What's it going to look like? What's going to be impacted in the, in the surrounding community? So uh, we went back to our GIS and we worked with the city and we developed an urban expansion model. Uh, the first thing we did is we represented where we didn't think expansion could go. So when I'm living in a house, I like not to be in water. So we excluded all the rivers, all the streams, all the water areas. I also don't like flooding. Um, I don't swim very well because I wear a boot on my right foot. Um, uh, I don't want to be uh, living on a runway because I don't like a lot of noise. Um, uh, I don't want to live in a park because I'm over the Occupy movement. Uh, I'm not a bird, so I don't want to live in a reserve. Again, I have a boot, so the military won't let me live on their land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a variety of criteria, existing roads, existing buildings. We turned this into this constraint mask. This is where growth could not go, physically could not go. But there was a second boundary to growth as well, and that was a political boundary. It was their urban growth boundary. We represented that here in the red. So the difference here was that's political. So if I'm savvy, I can change that. So we created a model that could accept multiple inputs. So the green area is what I had left, and that's where I could grow. So I'm going to show you this model. It's really simple. <laughs> it is, it is. It looks scary. So the top left side there, you see everything coming together? That's constraints. All I'm doing is adding all these polygons together into a constraint. Then the next little step there, all I'm doing is rating proximity to different things. So whatever's left over, if you're close to a commercial center, you're more attractive for urban expansion. If you're near other existing residential density, you're more attractive for urban expansion. If you're next to a transmission line, if you have ready access to sewers, if you have a, you're next to a park, a good school, etc. right? So we combined all those factors together to create a, a preference layer on the surface. Now the rest of the model, which does look complex, uh, what that does is that takes that surface and actually turns it and breaks it into very kind of finite areas that I can then measure and grow in, right? So I'll show you the surface. Green areas are really attractive to urban expansion. Red areas are less attractive to urban expansion. Well, we knew that if we did uh, the densification, 20% is still going to fall and it's still going to be urban expansion at the fringe. If we don't do densification, we don't do transit-oriented development, all of it's going to fall into this urban fringe. So this represents the urban fringe. And we knew the area numbers from that, assuming 3.5 thousand feet per uh, house that we're going to build, plus you know, some for roads. And we can actually simulate the growth of that, that uh, development. So this is, this is what's going to get, well, for lack of a subtle term, whacked if we don't do densification. Right? These, these light blue areas are all going to be developed. And then we can overlay on top of that, if we do do densification, what's going to get built out by the remaining 20%. And that's this kind of uh, dark, dark purple, dark blue color. Now you might notice uh, a little something that happened there. Um, we went beyond the boundaries of the light blue with the dark purple. That's because we're densifying in the walkable areas around those transit stations no matter what to accommodate that density. So great. That's a beautiful animation, Eric. Uh, again, our people aren't going to understand what you're talking about. You know, this is, we, need, we need a more visual example of what this is going to look like. So can you, can you show us what this is, what is, this is actually going to look like in 3D? Let me run that, run that again. So we took it back to City Engine, and we actually wrote a rule to generate, um, in essence, urban sprawl. So this is that preference surface, and what we're doing is we're filling it in with that development if we don't do transit-oriented development. So that's the whole area that's going to built out. You can see there's a, a kind of a little bit of a street neck in there, probably a, a slight increase in permeable surface, et cetera, right? So immediately you can see the visual impact. What I've done here is I've turned that off. The blue areas are what's going to get developed if we do do transit-oriented development. The yellow areas were the areas that we just saw get, get developed without transit-oriented development. And then we can again render that in City Engine and see the comparison. All right, so very powerful, very immediate visualization tool. And they said, that's great. You've done that in our office, but we want to actually push that out to the public and have them play with it and then be able to see it. 
So that's where the, the WebGL component comes in. And WebGL is a, a 3D technology that allows you to deliver 3D content on the web. Um, and City Engine can export its scenes to WebGL so you can share them with the public. So we developed uh, this little, little web-based application here. And what we can do is actually swipe between the two alternatives. So what we have on the, on the left side of the slider bar is uh, what will happen if there is no densification. What you're looking at now on the right is what there is. So we can provide this out to the public, and the public can just swipe across and say, well, What's the, what's the difference between the two developments? So, oh, why are they both small? I got them on the wrong side. So the, the, left, the right side is what's gonna be developed if we have transit-oriented development. The left side is what's gonna be developed if we don't. So significantly more land at the, at the urban fringe. So we went through this process with the city and uh, we realized a couple things when we did that, when we kind of summed it up at the end, is that if we do this densification, we're gonna save 105,000 acres of open space and agricultural land. That's significant. That's a significant amount of the kind of public value. If we don't do densification when we actually just let things continue as they are, we're gonna add a billion square feet of asphalt to maintain. That's a billion square feet of impermeable surface, right? And by doing this densification, we put people closer together to these transit stations so that we're actually gonna get the ridership we need and hopefully we take cars off the road. But more importantly, we kind of protect the values of the area. When you go to the city of, of Honolulu, you don't wanna look up into the hills and see development. You wanna look up and see green lush forest and beautiful landscape. The other thing we realized is that there was a pattern here. Now the whole process that I just showed you took us uh, two weeks, two people, two weeks. So not too bad. Um, but there was a lot of things that we pulled out of that we realized we could make easier for you. So we had a, a, a data model called the local government data model. We were pouring all of our data in that data model, but it's predominantly 2D. And there was all this effort we, we made to make it 3D. And we realized, why don't we just turn that into a data model and make a kind of a comprehensive data model? We, and provide that back out to the public. So we developed this concept of an urban information model. 